Hello, hello, hello. This is Alex Kashuta. You are listening to the Subversive Podcast. Uh, today I am joined by Pascal Emmanuel Gobri. He is a writer and a fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Awesome. I, um, I noticed that we had a lot of convergent thoughts. I mean, I'm, I'm a religious follower of yours on Twitter which is where <laughs> I find most of my guests. Um, and the, and I think we, we also have another thing in common. I think we have the same degree. I also am the uh, recipient of an MIM or MIM. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, the, the Masters in Management, the uh, McKinsey yeah. Farm. Um, I, I know that the HSA one is an, an extra uh, fancy one, but I did the SEMS. Yes. Yes, yeah, uh, HSA has the SEMS option. Uh, yeah, which you didn't take. It's the, yes. Uh, HSA actually created SEMS, I believe, back in the 80s or early 90s or whatever. Yeah, I think it was the one of the founding schools. Uh, and I think LSC, HSA, and yeah. St. Gallen or something. We, we completely love the Americans. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> sorry. So we have the uh, same type of degree. Um, I always say I'm an economist, but this is, yeah, uh, <laughs> master, master's in management is, is tangential to, to economics. I am a, I am a Ma future never was McKinsey person. I never yeah. worked at the consulting. Yes, exactly. It's, it, it's what you do when you want a job in, in consulting or back in the day in investment banking when that was a thing. Yeah. Exactly. Well, it, it was, uh, to me, it was kind of a, the next step after my, my economics degree. I was like, okay, this is the most prestigious thing that I don't have to pay for because I, I got it in, in Austria. So I just wow. jumped into the degree. So if you got in, it was a bit hard to get in. But once you were in, it was, it was on a scholarship. So I was like, yeah, good. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to get a nice Western degree. Yeah, no, I, I, I joked that I got a 20,000 euro IQ test. Um, yeah, I got mine for free. <laughs> that was good. I'm very angry right now. Uh, um, but France has this two-tier system of higher education with these extremely elite schools, and so when you come from a certain background, it's just something you have to do. Um, sort of like the Ivy League in the U.S. Um, and and my, my girlfriend at the time joked that I was the she was attending with me and. And she joked that I was the only person she knew who actually learned something at SSA. Um, because Did you? It, it, it's about getting in. It's a it's a great school, uh, but these these sorts of elite schools, you know, the the hard part is getting in. And if you want to go through and get your degree with learning absolutely nothing, you can do that. Uh, but also, you have like great professors and great academic options but you have to sort of go out and get them um and that that's what i did I, I i actually basically got a degree in math and not really a degree in business um because i took all of the hardcore finance courses which are really math courses yeah you you get a lot of like the optional stuff but yeah like you said it's there's not really much to do once you're in they kind of want to be pushing you through the funnel you got through the initial iq test you you sent in your gmat you're you're in so <laughs> you should be okay and, and, and in france there's like an unofficial curriculum which is uh all the student groups and student organizations uh that are really that's that's like an internal french thing there's like an invisible, unwritten curriculum um, with all these student societies that you have to sort of find a way to get into and be elected to. Ah, okay. Yeah, that, I, there, there might have been, because I, I did mine in, in Vienna and in Austria, and then my second year was in Barcelona. There might have been all of these groups that I <laughs> never joined and never <laughs> never even knew about. I'm sure there were some, some skull and bones things that I've always been like, oh, she's from Eastern Europe. No, 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 don't, don't invite her. <laughs> so, yeah. There, that's that's how you know you, know, you that's how you become a, a minister in Macron's cabinet. It's uh, yeah. who you work friends with in school. Ten yeah. Years ago. 
Yeah, that's a, I definitely wasn't wasn't elected for that <laughs> for that high office in, in any country, um, especially in yeah in Austria. It was really it was really hard to you know to to integrate you know being from from Eastern Europe. There's a bit of a hmm, it's a bit of an iffiness about about Eastern Europe and in the country's closest. You know, once you get to England, it's a bit chill, but the closer you are to to kind of the border of uh, of uh, Mordor. People don't, <laughs> they're not really into it. Um, I know France is, you know, France is close enough to, to Romania to know that there is suspicious activity going on here and that, <laughs> you know, that there are things that might uh, might not be kosher. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're happy to have you in the EU and to have, uh, and, and to give every Romanian the right to live and work here. Uh, <laughs> are you? <laughs> I don't know. Are you personally, or, or are you just are you speaking in general? <laughs> no comment. Uh... Yeah, and freedom of movement is a is a tricky one. Um, I mean, my my personal take on it is that it's you know it's it's an incredible proximal benefit for people you know in Eastern Europe to be able to to go bring in remittances and things like that. But in the long term, it is extremely destructive not only for you know the the economies where you know kind of the middle class is frozen out of you know the the usual jobs that no one wants to do in England or no one wants to do in France. They would do them if they had no choice. Um, but also because of the brain drain, you know and you know there's just so many people from from my generation from eastern europe that just exited the country and never came back and they're just still in you know it's it's a terrible it's a terrible loss for these countries which you know don't seem to be you know passing through transition you know getting to to the next level so yeah i don't know what what does that feel like from from your perspective what's um, what does freedom of movement mean to you pascal <laughs> Uh, what does it mean to me? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's right. Like the brain drain angle is, um, is I think like, one of the real problems with immigration that never gets discussed. Um, there's a sort of right wing angle that's like, well, these people are bad. Blah, blah, blah. And then there's a left wing angle, which is, you know, we, you know, I, whatever, I don't know how they think, uh, but the, these are these are all awesome people, but the real problem is the brain drain. Uh, and so, you know, you look at freedom movement within Europe. It's sort of specific because Poland isn't like Algeria. You know, it's a real country. Um, and and you know, as as a Frenchman, you know, I I know lots of people who are from um, from these Eastern European countries who are extremely talented. Uh, I'm happy that they're here, and yet at the sort of macro society level, you're like, well, was this a really good idea? Like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, to me, it feels like it's very tiered, and that only kind of the middle classes in these uh, in these countries kind of left, are left behind, because it's usually the people who you know have nothing to lose or have something have a lot to gain where you know they're they want to break into a hierarchy that doesn't exist in Romania like you know high academy or sciences or you know finance you know like London uh, or they have nothing to lose and they're criminals and they want to go to somewhere you know almost by osmosis to the place that has more that has more money so they do <laughs> and that's why Eastern Europe is extremely safe you know, no criminals okay. here. <laughs> so it's it's quite it's a, quite a tough one because you can't say, oh, you know, they're not sending their best. You know, they are, but they're also they're sending are. their worst. They're also not. <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, but I mean, I see it. I I knew I know a lot of these people, and I know people from the top stratum, and I know also know people from the bottom stratum. The people you know you always avoided when you were a teenager. You're like, no, 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 he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna try to you know grope me or, or get my money or something. He's gone, <laughs> and all his friends are gone, and all the super smart people are also gone. So it's just the you know the middle class who had something to lose, who had a little business or did something, but it's not you know the luminaries. Uh, they're not left behind, and. Right. Yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty depressing. Anyway, <laughs> um, my my big question is something that I've seen um, that we are both interested in, and also we we've kind of converged on kind of a similar conclusion about about liberalism and its yeah. faults 
And I think I'm I'm probably more of a of a an adherent of the the Patrick Deneen thesis that this is all natural. This is all kind of right. baked into the into the pie. Um, but I feel like you're, you might be a little bit more optimistic or, or, or not necessarily more optimistic, but have a more nuanced perspective on what might still be possible. Uh, um, I'm, wow, you've done your homework. Uh, <laughs> this is a new uh, podcast. <laughs> uh, that's, that's an, in, so that's an interesting question. Yeah. I, yeah. One of, one of my, uh, sort of usual criticisms of Deneen is that there's this almost like uh, almost Marxist sense of like this inevitable pro or Hegelian like history inevitably moves in that direction um, and and I don't like that but it's sort of a it's sort of a moot issue at this point because we have moved in that direction of sort of liberalism becoming this sort of nihilism of what or whatever you want to call it so maybe it could have been different we don't know um i'm i i hate the phrase i i mean i hate well first of all i have no hate because i'm, I'm a horrible far-right fascist so yeah white supremacist you know, I, I here I have, I have to uh i have to mention that i hate no one um i i don't like casting things in terms of optimism or pessimism because I don't believe that history has a direction and I I believe that uh, choice is real um, and, and people can you know people can impact history and that the 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 way that like big macro trends like you know whatever reduced fertility or whatever, become these inevitable forces is as a self-fulfilling prophecy and so people look at all of these trends in the west that are going in the wrong direction and they say well that's it it's done over we had a good run and then they do nothing and so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy i you know there's there's so much of a presumption uh because of hegel because of, of sort of like what I call vulgar Marxism, which is this idea that history is just purely, it's not the same as like actual like Marxist philosophy, but it's this implication that history is just purely driven by material forces, by, by you know, economic or social factors. Um, I, 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 I kind of want to say I believe in the great man theory of history, or at least I believe in the man not as opposed to woman necessarily, but in the man theory of uh, of history, um, and so it it doesn't really make sense to be either optimistic or pessimistic. I think what what it makes sense to be is to be realistic. Of course, nobody thinks that they're not realistic. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. but to not think of history as something that happens to us from outside, but as something that we do. Uh, and, and one of the good things about the, 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 the 21st century and this modern era is that, you know, if you have a podcast, you are, you know, in, in some small way affecting history, maybe. Maybe you're not, but like your choice, I mean, it's, it sounds really silly and sort of like fortune cookie when you put it that way, but everybody's choices, I believe, really do affect history. Mm -hmm. and, and, so we, and so we should, you know, all of these things are going poorly. Am I optimistic? Am I pessimistic? I, 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 I don't want to think in that way. And so yeah. like, on current trends, I am pessimistic, but on current trends, uh, you know, trends can and do change. So, yeah, I think my kind of my only apprehension to to the great man theory, as you know, as the constellation is right now, um, is that we're we're you know, this is what COVID taught me is that we are living in the most, you know, decrepit managerialism that has ever <laughs> existed on the face of the earth, the, the incompetence yeah. and the stratification and the unaccountability in this, you know, huge baroque bureaucracy that that 
rules us from the shadows is immense. So where would the great man, which, which thread should the great man start pulling on? Because I don't really see it. It's, it's really, uh, yeah, quite concerning. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's sort of, I mean, does it have uh, to be like a, an Elon Musk, someone who just, you know, comes at it from, from, you know, sideways and is not part of the institutions or creates their, their own institutions? Uh, seems like he's a, he's a mover and shaker, one of the last. Right. I mean, Elon Musk is a, a great example of what Will can do. Uh, and, and I do believe in the importance of, of Will. I'm going to sound fascist again. Damn it. Uh, but it, it, it is extremely important. And, and it really is uh, believing in the importance of will is, is sort of trium the diametrical opposite of the, the vulgar Marxist view of history. You know, if, you know, one is human will does nothing. Maybe human will doesn't do everything. But we're so conditioned to believe that it does nothing that you're probably better off sort of leaning on the other on the other side of the like if you're in a small boat and it's and it's leaning in one direction you have to lean all the way in the other direction just to get it even you can just lean a little bit um, and so you know I I was on Christmas break and during Christmas break as everything was falling apart. Uh, France is the slowest country in the world, or in Europe at least, for getting the for getting people vaccinated, and all of that stuff. I read uh, this great book on uh, the conquest of the Indian of the Indian Ocean by the Portuguese in the 16th century, which is just this incredible epic story that is just purely about will. And we don't hear about it, you know, it happened at the same time as Cortes, but uh, unlike Cortes, the Portuguese didn't have a big technological edge against like the Indians and, and, and the, uh, the Sultan of Egypt. Uh, it was just pure will. Like the, the Portuguese were con just getting there. The Portuguese were convinced that you could sail around Africa to get to the Indian Ocean, even though the Ptolemaic maps didn't said that, that that was impossible. And they sent ships and the ships got lost and they sent more ships and the ships got lost and they sent more ships for 80 years. And then Vasco da Gama found the way around Africa and they kept sending more ships. And their third um, expedition, w which was a grand total of 13 ships, they announced for, that from now on, the king of Portugal would levy a tax on all commerce in the Indian Ocean. <laughs> and so this entire empire was built by people who were never more than a few thousand because they would just send like a few ships at a time. Uh, it was led by this crazy man named Alfonso de Albuquerque, who was this complete madman who never slept, uh, gave everyone orders. Uh, you know, he, he, you know, he didn't just have to fight the Indians, like people mutinied against him because he was such a fanatic. Like he, he, he got shot by cannonballs, his ship sank and he was on a raft for months and he came back and all this crazy stuff. And those people were everything that we were taught to hate, right? They were fanatical Catholics. Uh, mm -hmm. The goal of the Indian Empire was to beat the Muslims and, and, and sort of like take Jerusalem from the back. Uh, <laughs> they were Western supremacists. They were, they, they, were, they were cruel. I mean, one of the reasons why the Portuguese won was, were so effective was because they were extremely violent. Uh, they were they were all these things, and they did something that's objectively insane, and just just purely through, through willpower. And and I remember reading this and and thinking, you know, if if Alfonso de Albuquerque had been in charge of COVID response for Europe, everyone would be vaccinated now. Like it would be done. It would be over. Like nobody would. And it's. And so 
I'm rambling a bit, but like, you know, there are obviously ways in which all of these bureaucratic systems are sclerotic and so on and so forth. But there are also ways in which, you know, again, it sounds sort of magical and trite, but in, in which will can actually like accomplish great things. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to take the good with the bad in, in, in that context. I think our civilization's not ready to take the bad <laughs> anymore. So we're kind of forfeiting the good as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, there's... Um, but are, are we ready or are we not ready? I mean, you know, the... I mean, obviously, like, if today, you know, somebody ran for office on the agenda of we're going to do, you know, a crusade to take back Jerusalem from, from the Arabs, like, he wouldn't get many votes. Uh, but, you know, um, it's not just us crazy people on the internet who understand that something is wrong and, and, and who feel that things are are heading south and that it, and that it's not right um and so you know there there's uh you you've read the the sort of flight 93 essay by michael anton i imagine uh the one where he endorsed trump in 2016 where he was it, it was the sort of first into conservative intellectual defense about trump of trump and and he sort of went through like yes i agree that he has all of these terrible flaws um of course but he's the only one who says i want to live i want my country to live i want my party to live and people i i i believe that you know a critical mass of western people want to live uh they may not know how but they want to live and they will recognize it when somebody offers them a path forward that, that will mean that they will live. Uh, we don't have that leader yet. Uh, but again, I, you know. Yeah, the need is there and you can, yes. you can feel it. It's, it's bubbling up. Um, I have actually, I have a, a related quote that I've picked out <laughs> about this. I think it is related. And I think, uh, you know, the, the quote goes a little bit like this. So I, I firmly believe that the cause of our derangement is that men have become losers. Um, is, <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, something tied into, into the, um, the death of great men, the, the scarcity of great yeah. men? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that quote was talking more about sort of relations between the sexes, but all, all of that is connected. Um, there's, um, I mean, the, 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 the sort of like anti-feminist or sort of like the manosphere movement sort of like blames women for uh, everything bad or sort of blames feminism or blames women for everything bad. And they're not wrong uh, in many ways, but it's like, why have women become like this? Well, maybe they've become like this because men suck. That's a theory. <laughs> Tell me and more. So maybe if men didn't suck, uh, then then women then women would be more rational and we would all be happy. Like the, the the way the way to talk women out of being crazy is not to talk them out of being crazy. It, it it's to just like be good men. Like deep down inside every angry internet feminist is a 13 year old girl who wants to be swept away by prince charming and there is no prince charming yeah yeah uh, i i i agree with this theory like there's there's something deep in there i think you know the, the people who blame feminism 
uh, are kind of to me like the people who blame postmodernism. They want, you know, like a singularity. They want something to have happened in the past, something that, pff, wow, it swept, it changed our civilization completely. But uh, a lot of these phenomena are descriptive rather than causal. They're just kind of they're emergent from something that's already there. And, you know, just looking at, there's there's so many articles nowadays about plummeting testosterone, uh, plummeting sperm counts, you know, men having the grip strength of 15-year-old girls. Like, there's some, something is going on on, like, a physiological, civilizational level. And it's not feminism, or maybe it is in the sense that feminism taught us to, you know, take the pill and then maybe urine's getting into the water supply or some, some like, yes, yes. 15 thousand dominoes down the down the line but um not directly i i have heard this about this estrogen in the water theory only just yesterday and found out that it's actually completely true like the, like it's completely like acknowledged in like completely mainstream studies and like official figures and nobody talks about it and it's insane and so i'm 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 not going to drink tap water anymore but um, yeah, so it's, and, and, and so the, 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 the way to sort of like the, the sort of like quote unquote manosphere, like notices facts that you're not allowed to notice. And they're correct about the fact that these facts are facts. Uh, but then they're like, well, we just need to like, you know, like talk women into agreeing with us. It's like, no. Uh, and also, like, maybe you're kind of a loser, dude. Like, <laughs> you know? And maybe you're, like, not somebody that, that, um, that somebody would want to live with. Like, and so, the, you know, and, and if you are a believer in sort of patriarchy, uh, and, and, and I don't think that you can you know, you don't believe in patriarchy any more or less than you believe in gravity. Um, but then if, if the men are supposed to lead the women, then aren't they the ones who are responsible for fixing the, the mess? Yeah. And aren't, they, aren't they the ones who we should hold responsible for having made the mess? And aren't they the ones we should hold responsible for fixing it? Yeah, exactly. You're not, you're not much of a patriarch if you complain about women constantly. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, you should step up. I know, I know a lot of, you know, people enamored with the patriarchy from their mother's basement. Uh, you should be careful because under the patriarchy, that's, that's usually a harem and you get nothing. So, right, right. <laughs> Right. Exactly. If you want equilibrium, you need to work on your your patriarchy a little bit harder. Right. And so, and and, uh, and it's it's all a chicken and egg, right? And so, like the, the the more men suck, the more women become crazy, and and because the women are crazy, the men become worse, and like it, and like it's a cycle. But like you have to pick one point which is going to break the cycle. Uh, and the point has to be men because women aren't going to fix themselves. Um, and so, you know, I'm not original in saying this, but like, you know, my advice is like lift weights, go outside, um, you know, have a positive attitude to life. I mean, all the sort of Jordan Peterson stuff, which, you know, I mean, some, some people on the, on, on, on the sort of like Christian conservative side of things sort of criticize him because he's like young and all that stuff. And like, that's, that's all true and fair at the philosophical le level, but fundamentally he's like a self-help guru who's telling like a bunch of 19 year old men, you know, stop complaining, shape up, make your bed, do push, do push ups, be a decent person, take ownership of your life. That's, that's wonderful. That's like the best thing that's happened to the world yeah. in like the years. And it's not a platitude because no one else is saying it. It's, yes. you know, yeah. Cause everyone's like, Oh, he knows, you know, he's saying the same things that my dad used to say. Well, he hasn't been saying it in years, your dad, cause he knows you're not going to listen. Cause it's so counterculture to be a decent person nowadays. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, another thing we have in common is a, a deep appreciation for the anonymous uh, side of, of Twitter or the, the internet weirdos. <laughs> why, um, why aren't you an anonymous user? 
Uh, so when, when I was something like 13 or whatever, um, and, and the internet was already a big part of my life, I sort of decided that I would always write everything under my own name. Um, and a, as a way to sort of like discipline myself to like, you know, when you write something under your own name, it's something that you have to stand by. Um, and, 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 you know, being a traditionalist, I can't break a vow that I took when I was 13. Like, that's just not an option. So there you go. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm sort of privileged, and I should check my privilege, uh, in that I, I'm, I'm a sort of like professional right-wing political hack. And so I have more scope for uh, saying horrible right-wing things on the internet. Uh, so I don't, you know, I'm, I'm certainly never gonna call someone who's anonymous on the internet a coward because like, you know, people lose their jobs and lose their families. Like that's, that's the world we live in for saying like completely like, you know, even, even innocuous stuff. Uh, like boys are boys and girls are girls. Um, and so I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying well, if you don't speak under your own name, you're blah, 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 blah. like, no, like I understand what people are living through. Uh, but I'm just saying I made this decision for myself. Um, and, and, um, and, and, and I like it. Um, and, you know, I've been canceled a couple of times, like actually like people like sort of like calling my boss and saying like, you know, are, are you really, you know, are you really confident in having this person on your staff? And, and God bless him. Uh, he's a great guy at Whelan. Uh, he sort of shrugged it off. Um, and the first time it happens, it's terrifying while it happens. It really is. And then you realize that it just goes away on its own. And then by the second time you're laughing and that's just a great experience to go through. Um, and and so yeah so i love anonymous twitter um I, I i think it's great i think you know it's wonderful but i'm on i'm under my own name i don't have an out you know obviously if i did have one that i would say i don't but i don't <laughs> um, um if i did have one you would know it though so uh i don't um and 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 I've just you know I thought about it a couple of times and I just decided like no I'm I'm burning my ships. Yeah, yeah, that's I that's essentially. My tweets. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good move. I mean, I think I think I might have deleted a couple of tweets, but nothing not not necessarily because of um, they were spicy or anything. I thought they just they were just really lame <laughs> from the beginning of my account when I was like there was nothing really doing I had no likes. It was just one of my old essays just thrown into the void when I didn't know how to use Twitter. So I was like, Yeah, I'm just gonna <laughs> just gonna manicure my, my profile a little bit just in case people scroll back and see what the hell is this. So yeah. Um but yeah, I'm I'm of the same of the same mind and I, I really I thought about this for a while. Um and I was thinking I actually made an anonymous account right when I started kind of reusing Twitter sometime in, in August. But I don't know, I just had it on for like one day and I was like, this is, this is so weird to be, I was like, a, I had a, like a locust avatar for some reason. I thought that was pretty biblical. <laughs> and then I was like, yeah, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to be myself and, you know, we'll see what happens. And yeah, I mean, haven't haven't been uh, haven't been ousted and ostracized or cancelled yet, but you know, life is long. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, cancel culture is mostly like a, a, an interest civil war of the left. Um, <laughs> you know, we're I mean, sort of like people who are sort of out as conservatives are sort of like baked into the cake. Um, yeah, it's not as interesting. It's like the, the narcissism of small differences, it seems to me, because you kind of have to be uh, sensitive to the fact, like if someone calls me right wing, I'm like, yes, 
hello <laughs> so what what else is new uh if, if they call someone right wing who doesn't want to be called right wing well uh, uh oh that's uh that's scary um so yeah i think yeah just coming out guns blazing it feels good as well i mean for me i you know i've, I've worked in in tech in london for a long time it's a very deep monoculture and i had to you know, kind of smile my way through a lot of discussions and, you know, it's just, you know, you don't want to rock the boat because there are people, you know, you work with every day and, but at one point I was like, okay, I'm, you know, my, my cup overfloweth, I need to, I need to do something. So I was just like, yeah, okay, Twitter it is. Right. Yeah. Um, I have a another um, kind of quote from you, which I think is is uh, representative, and I really like. Um, and it's it's essentially kind of in the in the vein of liberalism, but I, I want to get your your expanded take on it. It's um, more and more people are understanding that the only thing modernity offers is consumer crap from China, divorce, and joyless sex at best. Which I found was uh, very much aligned with my own thinking on on the, the thing. You know what? Um, what is so uh, defective in modernity? Uh, what is so defective in more in modernity? <laughs> oh God! Um, I mean, there there there's two. Um, I mean, the, the quote itself, I think, is is pretty self-explanatory, which is that, uh, you know, once you decide that there is no God, then then what is life? It's it's buying shit and having sex, uh, and then it turns out that people aren't even having sex. Well, th like the first thing you find out is that the the unattached sex that you can have really isn't that fun and then the second thing you find out is that uh that's if you're on the chat side of the spectrum and then if you're on the incel side of the spectrum you, you find out that you're not even having the sex that everybody is telling you everybody is having right yeah. so so that's just the reality of our, our of life and, and and uh in con in context if i recall i was sort of like speaking about christianity in france um, and there's definitely a sense among the younger generation, they were brought up by parents who were the sort of post sixties generation who were like, you know, we're going to be liberated. It's going to be awesome, blah, blah, blah. And they found out that their parents, you know, they got rich, but they also got divorced and were super miserable. Um, and so maybe there's something more to life that, than that, um, as as to the broader question of like what is modernity and why, I mean, if you've got you know that's that's the that's the million dollar question, right? Um, I um, I don't know that I have a particularly sort of original take on this. I think I mean, um, uh, the the sort of more most charitable. Um, interpretation of modernity is that it's a Christian heresy that tries to reach Christian ends through unchristian means. Uh, you know, there, there's a Chesterton line, which is the modern world is full of Christian ideas going crazy. And, you know, equality, uh, you know, sort of like, you know, an ethic of compassion. Um, all of these things are Christian ideas. Like if, if, if you explained it, if you explained like the, the sort of left-wing sensibility to Cicero, like he wouldn't even understand what you're talking about. Like you, like you could, you could, you would have a better conversation with an AI or a Martian. Uh, he, would, he wouldn't compute. Like mm. the, the, these sorts of ideas and sort of moral impulses are only possible in a world that has had the Christian gospel. Um, and, 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 you know, just like, you know, women went crazy because men failed, uh, the Western world went crazy because the church failed. Um, and, and why and how did it fail? I mean, the, 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 I, the most famous take on that is, is sort of Dostoevsky's parable of the Grand Inquisitor, which is, you know, Christians became worldly and sort of like, 
used their power, which neg negated the power of the Christian message. Um, um, I'm sort of rambling now. Um, no worries. But, no worries. <laughs> That's what podcasts are for. <laughs> um, there's this basic sense in which, like, modernity is this sort of like twisted Christianity that comes out of the back end of a, of a failed uh, of a Christian civilization that did not manage to to make Christianity manifest uh, in real life, uh, like you know. It, around the year 1000, you know, it's like, it's like the same thing as Trump. Like Trump was elected in 2016. We're now in 2020, the presidency, the house, and now the Senate are blue. Like he failed, like empirically, like you can yeah, make up yeah. lots of excuses. He had the deep state against him. He had the media against him, blah, 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 blah. And all of these may be true, but like bottom line is he failed. And so you're at the year 1000, um, Christianity rules the West. The, 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 the emperor of Germany comes to the Pope's residence in the snow in a robe and kneels outside in the snow for three days to beg the Pope for forgiveness. Like that is the level of power that the church had over this entire civilization um and then you fight you fast forward 500 years later and like everything is a shambles everything is a mess you have this guy nailing stuff to a church door uh you know you have you know a, a, a council that sort of like you know oh to celebrate let's just burn this heretic in the public square like that's that's a very christian thing to do um and so um, and so on the back of that failure of, uh, of Christianity, you had a bunch of people who tried to make Christianity, you had a bunch of people who weren't Christians, but tried to make Christianity real. And it turns out that it was even worse. Um, and so what does that mean for Christians? Um, I think it means, and I don't have all the answers, but I think it means, first of all, like understanding where things went wrong um before sort of trying to make things better because like you know you you, you have some some of these trad catholic guys who are huge admirers of medieval civilization and it's and they're right that it was a great civilization and that you know we don't talk about it enough because most of history is propaganda and so you're not allowed to talk about like all of the great things they did that it was a technologically advanced civilization and all and all that stuff but it failed. It, it demonstrably empirically failed. Um, and so like just going back to it isn't, isn't going to work. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I, I've sort of like got myself into a dead end here. <laughs> no, no worries. Um, yeah, I think the, 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 the problem as always is essentially the, the nature of power, you know, kind of the, the iron law of, of oligarchy and that essentially that that's kind of the difference between the year 1000 and the year 500. It's just a degeneration of power in the church. And I guess, you know, Martin Luther had a point when he was nailing that stuff to the door. It obviously had terrible ripples down, down the line. Um, but you know, corruption was rampant, you know, yeah. people had lost uh, kind of their, their grip on the faith. Um, and yeah, I mean, to be honest, I think to, to me that that moment of the of nailing the, the thesis on the, on the door was more, uh, was more representative for what's what's going on right now than, than, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, Foucault or people who are, you know, taken as as the the creators of our current situation. So, yeah, things things are, you know, history is emergent. Things take time. They 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 snowball, and I think that's kind of where, um, yeah, where our predicament comes from. The the loss of faith by Christianity and the West in itself, because it had good reason at at one yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's an it's an interesting um, 
it's an interesting thing being a Catholic nowadays. I mean, you are a Catholic, but you're not a trad trad cath, are you? Not, not particularly. Um, I, I I I respect the trad, uh, but uh, I'm I'm trad adjacent. Um, it, it, if, if you if you if you take me to an old mass, I won't be lost and confused. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's that's not the mass I go to every Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's um, it's interesting because I'm, I'm I'm theoretically Catholic as well, though I'm not not very practicing, and I'm one of those you know uh, Eastern European uh, amalgam Catholics. So I I've come from I have Catholicism in my family from three distinct regions. I'm Hungarian Catholic, Polish Catholic, and German Catholic. So wow. <laughs> I am profoundly Catholic, but not not very. All, all um, impressive breeds of Catholic. I guess <laughs> I don't know. If a French Catholic sounds so sounds quite aristocratic. I'd love to. I'd love to have some of this, some of that. Um, we're, we're, we're pretty good, but uh, we we haven't um, haven't suffered as much. Let's, let's put it that way. Yeah, in, in many ways. I mean, <laughs> the French have suffered in different ways. Um, but you know what's um, what's kind of your take on on what the the present of Catholicism is like for someone who is practicing? You know, do you see it? Is it a dying movement? Is there kind of a bit of a renaissance? Is is something happening? Because I know the trad caps are really hot on Twitter and they're pushing their stuff, and but they're very much a, to me a fringe movement. Um, is is the is a mainstream doing anything? I. I don't know, and it's it's so it's it it's so hard to tell. Um, first of all, because it's hard to get good numbers, and like, what are, what are you gonna measure? Like, I mean, you can measure things like how you know, like how often people go to church, and like if you ask them, do you believe X? Uh, but is is that you know fundamentally like the measure of the church's success is whether it builds saints. Um, and, and you can't really measure for that. Uh, and, and you can have a church that looks very healthy on the outside, but is rotten on the inside. Um, and so I, I, I don't, um, it, it's, it's always so hard to tell for the, about these things. Um, and then you have all these sorts of anecdotal evidence. I mean, they're, you know, certainly in France, um, there's tons of sort of like very, very good, very sharp, very sort of um, entrepreneurial in the good sense of the term, like active young Catholics. Uh, but how many are they really? You know, it, it's it's always hard to tell. Um, I I I sort of accept um, Ross Daffett's sort of like acceler accelerationist is that how you say it yeah, uh, yeah. accelerationist uh, sort of take on the uh, the Francis papacy which is that you know the there was a sort of like John Paul II Benedict attempt at a sort of synthesis or a sort of moderate conservative um, yeah synthesis of like the various strands of Catholicism um and 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 the francis papacy sort of like real you know sort of showed that it didn't work um it it, it it was it was not a lie but maybe a mirage because it turns out that the 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 libs uh weren't so much ac accepting this compromise as just like biding their time um, and, and, and it turns out that they don't, um, they don't accept a lot of stuff that people like me would, would consider as, you know, not just like stuff that we agree on or just stuff that we can disagree on, but stuff that's like at the basis of the Catholic faith. Um, yeah, it's, it's liberation theology or nothing now need to, need to get get with the program yeah i mean you know i'm i don't follow the the church as much but i've been following it a little bit since since francis has uh, become very vocal about uh, his stances on on so many things and um and i've also noticed that they're kind of retconning uh benedict to be uh 
essentially a Nazi. <laughs> so any any reference to him has to say something about his sordid past or something like that. I've, I've, I rarely see anything written about him that doesn't kind of tilt to say, oh, okay, this guy is suspicious and he's, you know, he's uh, an aider and a better of, of abuse or, or something. So his history has already, you know, been been confined to, to the dark uh, the dark popes. Well, it, it, if someone's not calling you a Nazi, you're doing something wrong. So Yeah, that's, that's my entire motto. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it's uh, but again, these things are so, so overdetermined. Like, you know, my friend Michael Brendan Doherty sort of made this point that, you know, for 99% of, of the history of the Catholic Church, 99% of Catholics spend their entire life knowing nothing about, like, what the Pope was doing or saying on any particular day. And it just didn't impact their life because, like, you didn't know, like, not because it was hidden, but because there wasn't, like, this global media environment where the Pope is the most famous Christian on the planet. And, and, and every time he, he sort of, like, moves his lips, you know, there's 500 cameras on him and it goes on Twitter immediately, right? Um, and so you could have all of these things going on in the Vatican, like, good or bad, uh, and and it just wouldn't have an impact on like the the average Catholic. Like you know, like imagine like going to a village in Poland in the 19th century and saying, "Well, Pius the Ninth just you know had this interview in the Observatore Romano. Like, what do you think about this? Like, what does it mean for the like?" You know, he would sort of look at you and be like, "Like, why why are you asking me about this?" Like not just like a believer, like a priest, like a bishop, you know? Yeah, yeah, there's a there's some, like, some profound... Like, Romano, like, what? Yeah, there, there's some, some something profound about just, just the visibility of people and the, you know, the inherent in accountability of being visible that right. kind of shoots a little bit into the great man of history thing because, you know, these, these popes were... You know, mostly great men. They they were pulling strings of of a uh, you know extremely heavy strings, and they were moving you know everything around in geopolitics. Um, now, if everyone is looking at you and they're constantly monitoring everything you say, even as a as a question of how much time you you dedicate to PR, you don't have enough time to to manage the appearance of you and also do real stuff that requires, you know, an iron hand. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, so anyway, so, you know, the, you know, like, there's, there's this sense in which, oh, there's this synod about the family. It's like, what does it mean? Well, actually, it means nothing because it's going to publish this 500 page document that nobody's ever going to read. And life in every parish is just going to go is just going to go on the exact same way that it went on before. Um, and so, you know, like the, what does it all mean of the Pope Francis papacy? Maybe not much in the end. Um, yeah. I it mean, may be a lot. it may be a, it may be a schism like, like Ross says, I don't know, but I, I think that that's something we don't think about enough. Like, Maybe it just doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I think it shouldn't matter, but I also think it it kind of does just because the faith is is kind of on on the decline, and now you know, kind of everything matters um, because people just you know they they don't really have guidance. So you know, the the local parish you know is is a little bit of guidance, but if you know throughout the hierarchy of of Catholicism, people lose their uh, their trust in the actual thing then, you know, it's going to trickle down into the individual parishes as well. And I think it has. I mean, 
it's uh it's hard to to i mean you know eastern europe is quite a you know probably more proportionally more religious place than western europe and even here you know church attendance has plummeted and um especially in, in catholicism because this is this is the religion of the enclaves here the main mainline romanians are are you know kind of greek orthodox you know romanian right orthodoxy um and then you have kind of little pockets of, of catholics but you know those are the people who have left <laughs> they they went back to to germany they went you know to western europe or something so it's um yeah it's unfortunate but um another thing that's that's come up we have another religion that is uh that is dominating everything and i feel like you've been writing about this uh, you've been tweeting about this uh, it's uh, it's science why isn't science the successor religion it's so much better it's rational it's made by smart people experts love it you know Very yeah, the smartest people, smarter than us, anyway. So smarter why? Smarter and better than you, also. Of course, of course. You know, you ha we have to defer to them. You have to trust the experts, and just lean back and let them guide us into the future. Um, I don't know. Why? Why shouldn't we do that? Uh, uh, we absolutely should should defer to scientists. And how dare you suggest anything otherwise? Uh, I, the 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 sort of. Uh, God, this is such a big conversation. I mean, the, the um, one of the one of the problems. Um, uh, I think this is a really, really profound uh, subject, and so there, there's one angle, which is the angle that everybody who's not like completely brainwarned knows, which is that you have a ruling caste in the West. And when they want to say stuff, and th when they want to do something, they just shout, "It's science! Shut up!" Like everybody knows this, and like that's that's obvious. Like every everybody knows it. Like your grandmother knows it. Like the, the dumb guy down at the pub knows it. It's not a secret. Um, there's only 10% of the population that doesn't know it. And they're all, they're all very highly educated and they're all in antidepressants. Um, the, the, the sort of more profound thing is that uh, science in the West or everywhere really, because, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, China, you, you can sort of argue about where China is, but it's only become competitive with us very recently, um, has declined uh, in a sort of very big way. And, and, it's, and it's happened in all of the sciences. There are some where it's sort of like very obvious. So there's this thing called the replication crisis in, in psychology and in most of the social sciences where uh, basically, you know, people are finding out that all of these experiments that were done, that were published in peer reviewed journals, cited hundreds and thousands of times, you try to run the experiment again, and it doesn't work. And so you essentially have to like throw out like entire branches of the science. And so, uh, you know, in psychology, the number of experiments that doesn't replicate, like depending on who, who you ask is maybe 50, 60, 70%. Uh, and, and that's, uh, and that undercounts the total number of experiments that don't work because it's only the experiments that work that do get published to begin with. And so the total number of experiments is, is much higher. And so it's probably like 90% of the experiments that don't work. Uh, and so there are places where it's really obvious. Uh, but if you look at a place like uh, medical science, um, you know, pharma, uh, the pharma industry, who, like, unlike professors, like their livelihood actually depends on this stuff. Uh, there's a, there's an unwritten rule of thumb uh, in the pharma industry that basically 50% of like science papers are junk. Uh, there's a very famous paper by this guy named John Ioannidis at Stanford. Uh, with a provocative title, uh, which is uh, why, uh, why most published research findings are false. And he sort of like walks you through this mathematical demonstration. Um, uh, that basically like probably more than half of 
the published research findings in biology are false. And you sort of like go up like the tree, like we all understand that you have like these really soft sciences like psychology and sort of like human sciences. And we sort of know they're soft, but we know that there's like the hard science stuff up there and like that's hard, that's strong. And so you sort of go up it's like, all right, psychology sucks, but biology, biology is a real science. Oh no, well, it turns out that half of it is crap. <laughs> Um, they they uh, they also tried to replicate experiments in biology, and and they found uh, two meta studies have found that the experiments that don't replicate are more likely to be cited than the ones that do. Yeah, I mean they, they're so, probably yeah. showing something you know interesting or politically you know right. expedient. I, I mean, there, there's absolutely some of that, but it's also stuff that's just not political at all. Like you know, like what kinds of cells are more likely to give you cancer. I mean, just like technical stuff that just doesn't work. Um, and so there's a sort of cumulative effect because it's not just like bad studies that are going out. It's like those bad studies are, are more likely to become the basis for further studies and like to become the basis for like an entire branch of science. Um, and so you sort of go up and then you go up to the hardest of all sciences, which is string theory uh and which today even mainstream even most mainstream physicists will admit that string theory doesn't work and that, that you know they've, they've been going at this for basically 30 years now and and it just doesn't work and nobody has any idea like i mean if it, it they will they will say things like yes it doesn't work but it's all we have <laughs> like yeah. nobody any idea of another theory that could potentially like work um and and so you, and so you realize that you have a <coughs> i'm sorry a serious problem which is i'm sorry. that's what you get for being french and smoking <laughs> um, you have a serious problem, which is much deeper than the problem that everybody knows about, which is uh, the politicization of science and just saying, like, it's science, shut up. Um, and, and why is that is anybody's guess. Um, but there, there are sort of more obvious stuff, like the way we do science would be, like, incomprehensible to, you know, like random dangerous people like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein or <laughs> Louis Pasteur. Uh, like uh, we, you know, speaking of Pasteur, we're sort of like celebrating the, um, I don't think it's 100th, there's an anniversary of the time where um, uh, there was this kid who had been bitten by a rabid dog, and so he injected the kid with his experimental uh, rabies vaccine, and the kid lived. Uh, of course, today he would be thrown in jail for doing that, right? Yeah, of course. <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, he was proven. too much of a great I'm man. Proven. Yeah, no, no FDA. He was in the New York Times, and like they would be calling for his blood. Um, you know, there's uh, the way it's funded is completely crazy. We have this system where, you know, we know historically that scientists are at their most productive when they're young. And so we're going to make sure that when they're young, they don't get to do anything and they don't get to decide what they study. It's only when they turn 40 and they get tenured and then they get to decide what they work on, which is exactly backwards. I mean, there's all this organizational stuff which everybody, everybody who works, I mean, everybody who knows how science works and isn't like completely and isn't like, you know, directly benefiting from the system will agree. Uh, the way peer review works. Uh, yeah, PP hacking. I mean, if, if someone funded a, a study and there's a lot of money of someone's in your study, you want to use that data set until it, it's something interesting comes out of it and then you publish that and yeah. that's terrible. Yeah. And so fraud is rampant and it's so rampant that if you ask academics, they will tell you like there, there's, uh, if you phrase the question right, that like there are surveys, like if you ask scientists 
um, do you dis do you, you know do you decide you know when you decide which statistical technique you use for your results? Do you look at the results and then pick the the technique that gives you the results that work? Like there are surveys, and like over fifty percent of scientists say yes, and like technically that's fraud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and that's like the like it's become so ingrained ingrained in the way people are doing quote unquote science that if you ask them, they'd be like, yeah, sure. Sure. That's how I, that's how I got my paper and the Lancet. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so there's, there's all this stuff. Um, you know, everybody, uh, everybody who, you know, on this sort of right has heard about the SoCal affair where this guy sort of like wrote this gibberish paper and got it admitted to a like postmodern gender studies journal. Uh, much, much fewer people know that the British Medical Journal, which is the, one of the most prestigious scientific journals in the world, um, got taken by a similar hoax where they received a paper that was intentionally stuffed uh, with errors. Uh, most of the reviewers uh, validated it. Zero of the reviewers found all of the intentional obvious errors. Um, a subset of the reviewers was told that the paper was not legit and they did not find more errors than the, than the control group. I mean, just like, anyway. So you have all of this process stuff and like science doesn't work at its sort of like more fundamental level than, than the political stuff. And then you start to wonder about sort of like philosophical questions. Um, uh, the, the way I, I mean, what I was taught about how science works from having, uh, from having a sort of liberal arts education before I became debased and went into to business school, um, and, and from sort of like having, you know, people in my family who were both Catholic and scientists, um, is that um, science is this empirical process of trial and error uh, that is supposed to produce um, reliable predictive rules about the world. In other words, it's not a search for the, for the truth with a capital T, it's the opposite of a search for the truth with a capital T. That was what the scientific revolution was about. Like Aristotle was like, science is a search for capital T truth. And Galileo was like, no, it's just like, let's do experiments and see what works. And not worry about capital T truth, just worry about like testing things. Um, nobody is taught anymore that that's what science is. Um, because and 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 this is the sort of more speculative answer um because if you're taught this sort of like earlier renaissance vision of science then you realize that the question of god is still completely an open question like there's just no connection between the question of like you know does does a bowling ball fall at the same speed as a light ball and the question of God. Whereas if science is the search for capital T truth and scientists who are much smarter than you haven't found God, then there isn't a God. Um, and so, and so the sort of like quote unquote conspiracy theory, not in the sense that there's an actual conspiracy, but in the sense that there's this sort of collective sense where, where, you know, we're trying to trick ourselves into believing this, these things. Um, if you define science as capital T truth, A, it's politically very convenient because then you get to say, well, you have to do this because it's science, shut up. But also B, it's metaphysically convenient because then you get to be an atheist. Um, and you don't have to listen to the crazy Christians. And, and, and the sort of combination of that uh, the, the real inventor of the scientific method is Francis Bacon, um, the, the sort of 16th century British statesman, um, who, like many of the great philosophers of his time, didn't think of himself as a philosopher. He was a politician, and he only started writing philosophy while, 
once he got disgraced and sort of like exiled to his country estate and so he's like well i'll show them and he writes <laughs> um and so in the in the novum organum so the new the new process where he sort of lays it out it's it's incredibly uh prophetic like he even you know he not only invents the scientific method, but like, he, because he's a politician, he sort of like invents, you know, he basically like designed the, the government sponsored R and D lab. Like he, like he, he writes about this stuff like in detail. Um, and one of the things he writes is, um, science is not the search for the truth but you have to trick scientists into believing that, it this, that it's the search for the truth because that's how you, you're going to get the most talented people to become scientists. So Bacon is a politician, he's an English politician. Uh, he proposes this new way of doing science, which is essentially like a branch of engineering. And, and he says, you know, you want your most talented people to become scientists, which for him means super engineers, not, not truth discoverers. And the way you trick your most talented people into becoming like engineers is to tell them that this is the new way to search for truth with a capital T. Uh, and, and the implication of this is like, he's very, he's a very practical man. Like basically it's like, you know, if we don't do this, then the French are gonna get better cannons than us. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? It's, it's very, it's very, um, it, it's practical. He's not, he's not an airy fairy guy. Like he was the minister of finance of Britain. Like he was, he's just like, all right, like I'm writing this letter of the, to the king. This is, this is the program for like getting better cannons and better ships and kicking the French's ass. Like that's. Yeah. I mean, like you said, he, he was prophetic because that's essentially what we have. Um, because the science that works at the moment is, engineering we have a very good engineering and we have these miraculous almost you know almost magical objects that do things that most people don't understand like ask ask someone on the street like how does a microwave work you know they're not gonna be telling you about faraday cages or anything they'll be like it's magic it's some some form of science it's science so they'll be you know essentially because of this uh, you know emergent engineering that we've perfected we have essentially turned into a cargo cult of science because all these objects they function through magic that we don't understand but science the science people the engineers they understand how to do it so i guess it's it's in a way the only remaining form of magic in society that no one gets but you know, it's in a way, it's not surprising that these guys are our, our holy, you know, the the priests of our society, because right. you know, there's there's not really, like you said, you know, the purpose of the church is to create saints. Well, we've created secular saints with Steve Jobs and and people like that, you know, and I guess celebrities as well. But yeah, anyone who's highly competent in the in the engineering field is now a saint. Yeah. Except that it's fake confidence because, like, the microwave was invented in the fifties. Um, yeah, the computer also. I mean, it's all kind of refining the same stuff at this point. But they do look pretty sexy, to be honest. <laughs> the, the design yeah, is nice. Microwaves are very nice, uh, but there's. I mean, this is the entire great stagnation theory, which I assume you're familiar with. With you know, like everything just sort of like one stop around 1970, uh, 1968, probably. Um, and so like everything that advanced since then, apart from computers and the internet is just like, I mean, you know, like a plane today is like, is the same as a plane in the sixties. Like it- Yeah, literally, they're still flying. More fuel efficient. <laughs> um, and and but you know when when our parents were our age like they they fully assumed that there would be like colonies on the moon and stuff yeah flying cars all of that flying bionic cars. man <clears throat> yeah yeah we um, didn't get that we did get refined telephones the, the most refined telephone you can even imagine yeah <laughs> that's true and and that's not nothing but it's it we sort of ended up using using it to distract ourselves from the fact that nothing else works and yeah. nothing else. 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 also kind of the, the, the to me, I think one of my pet theories that you know once you know the market figured out how to satisfy needs, it went into the business of creating desires. You know, once you you go past the Maslow, you know, basics, you you get into into the creation of desire, and this is the easiest way to create desire. It's a mar it's the market in your pocket. It talks to you all day. It tells you what to buy. It tells you how to think, what to be interested in. Um, and I think you know, there's a little bit of a turning point at that at that juncture. And uh, we've been we've been kind of addicted to these things since because they're just so good. The market is excellent at tell at giving you what you want, and then maybe suggesting other things you might want and then and then kind of using yourself to 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 recreate all this stuff and it's um to me it's quite a, a scary force and i see it you know i see it acting on myself i see it acting on other people um and it's i think it's also part of what's kind of fraying you know the traditional communities it's you know it's it's to me it's essentially what Denine's describing this is kind of the end point or the point where we are of of kind of the 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 individual, you know, because as an individual, that's kind of the only way to interact with the market. The market treats you as an individual, like, uh, you know, the the mill style individual completely severed from any obligation yeah. to, to anyone else. Yeah. So, you know, this is the, the ultimate of, of freedom to be to be given exactly what you want when you want it constantly and then more even more so. Yeah, except yeah. that we don't actually want it and we're miserable, but yeah. we don't even it. Exactly. Uh, the, the, the fundamental reason for that is that there is no productivity. Um, like, you know, um, because there's no real new stuff, we have to, we have to sort of like trick ourselves with fake new stuff. Like, I, 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 I'm sort of sympathetic. Like, I have all of these friends who believe that, you know, smartphones you know do these destructive things with dopamine in your brains and that like they should be banned as a public health thing um i'm sort of like i i don't dismiss it out of hand but i sort of wonder if it's not more of a symptom than a cause and it could it could be both and my example of this is like is tinder and like one of my friends told me well look tinder is clearly like creating these and it's like imagine imagine a healthy world like imagine like earth 2 where women are brought up in two parent households where they're taught by their parents to respect themselves and you sort of pitch this product where it's like all right you're going to put your picture there and then somebody's going to look at your picture and if he likes, he swipes right. And if he doesn't like your picture, he swipes left. And that's who you're going to put, be put in touch with. They would laugh at your face. They would say, are you joking? Yeah, yeah. I mean, every, everything's emergent. That's, yeah. that's a great way of selecting the men I don't want to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Are you crazy? Like, yeah. Want me to put my photo on an app that's designed like, like what is this a joke? Is, is there a hidden camera? And so, like, the problem here is not the smartphone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's everything around it. But it's just you know, kind of all all of these things are kind of systems that um, they they push each other, you know, it's kind of like, the problem is this isn't the smartphone until it is, you know, it's like the, the right. first mover was something else, but then we got the smartphone and then the smartphone was yeah. its own thing. And it's like, you know, the, the tool becomes the person and the, the person becomes a tool, something like that. So yeah, yeah. It, it probably makes things worse at the margin, but like, I, you know, there's, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I just think it's kind of a cope to say, oh, we, well, we just need to ban iPhones. Well, oh yeah. No, that's not realistic. And second of all, like it's not going to fix the problem. No, no, absolutely. I wouldn't give mine up. <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> Cool. So um, before we wrap this up, I want to ask you a question that I uh, am trying to ask everyone who comes on the show, you know, as in the typical show question. Um, is there a thinker or writer that you feel is not getting um, enough airtime or people are not thinking about, you know, that could be um, useful 
to interpret our current situation. You know, someone that you like as a thinker, but people are just don't don't know enough about. Sort of like living or dead. Doesn't matter. Someone you uh, you like and was influential on you, and you think well, might well, be good. Well, I, sh I should probably think of a black queer woman. Um, Disabled, please. Yes. Uh, um, he's sort of come back in vogue, um, so this may not be a very original answer, um, uh, but, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick a dead white guy, of course, um, it's, it's gonna be, uh, James Burnham, um, and, and, uh, his suicide of the West is just, is just, excellent and, and was a great tale in terms of understanding progressivism as fundamentally a, a suicidal impulse. And, and once you understand that about progressives, like ev just everything else falls into place. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I haven't read Suicide of the West, but I've read the, the Machiavellians by James Burnham, and that was very much a, a black pill for me as well. It's an extremely useful book to read on politics. Uh, I'm in progress with the with the Machiavellians. I know that it's like the one to read. Uh, I still haven't completely read it. Uh, I probably read too much Straussians on Machia uh, Machiavelli. Like, I, it's hard for me to get into it. But so it, it, it's a short book. It's really easy to read. It's it's really relevant. Um, it it's well written. It's not like a big philosophy book. Um, and so, yeah, that uh, I'll probably come come up with something much better like the minute after we're done with this. But that's like my answer I right now. I don't think you can come up with something much better. I know he's come back, but I don't think you know people are thinking enough about Burnham. Uh, yeah, he's definitely. Yeah, I wanted. I wanted to find a French guy. Um, Welbeck. <laughs> Should we be reading Welbeck? No, that that's too cliche. All right, French guy, uh, Marc Bloch, uh, E L O C H, uh, and he wrote this book, The Strange Defeat. Uh, so he's this uh, history professor. Uh, he's he's a Jew from Alsace, so the region that was conquered by the Germans in the nineteenth century. And like, there is no more patriotic demographic in early 20th century France than Jews from Alsace. Like they're, they're, they're the most French patriotic people you can imagine. And so he's this history professor, he's a decorated officer in World War I and he's sort of recruited in World War II and he sort of like has a front row seat as a sort of staff officer to the collapse. And he goes home uh, having seen this as a sort of like one of the greatest historians of France, um, just dashes off this short book in anger, hides it between floor tiles in his ceiling and goes into the French resistance and, and, and he gets shot in 1944. And like people find this book by accident later. And it is just the, the first half, which is about the fall itself, is sort of interesting as military history. But the second half, which is sort of the root causes, is this perfect portrait of what happens to a country when its elite has sort of like collectively like given up. Mm, yeah, and timely. They don't believe in anything and where we're, they're just here to like make money and lie, 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 lie to, 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 to the rest while they're making money and having parties and they don't believe in anything anymore. And, and like, and you know, it's like, you know, Hemingway said like, you, you know, the way you go bankrupt is bit by bit and then suddenly, and that's what happened in France, you know, in the thirties and then 1940, like curtain. And, and it is like, it, it should be required reading for anybody who wants to sort of like get into a, like an elite position. It should be required reading in Ivy League colleges because it really is a portrait of a nation, of how a nation commits suicide through its um, reckless and morally dissolute elites. Uh, it's just, it's just brilliant. So I, w I wanted to shout out a French guy. Yeah, perfect. So it's it's Marc Bloch. Uh, what's the title? The Strange Defeat. The Strange Defeat. Yeah, that's uh, sounds sounds really timely. Sounds a bit like the strange death of Europe. <laughs> 
Yeah, no, I, I read it once in college, and so it was always sort of in the back of my head, and then I read it again like six months ago, and I was like, holy crap, this is like even more accurate and timely than I thought I remembered. Yeah, there are some writers, like, to me, Burnham is one of these writers that you you really can't tell when the book was written, um, especially because, you know, it refers back to the 16th century, but, um, and I think Christopher Lash is like that as well, you know, yeah. it could have been written yesterday, um, so, yeah, I think this was super instructive, I hope there weren't any, you know, insistent questions about France, I did my best. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was great. Yeah, so, yeah, you... I expected a lot more questions about sex, so I was... I was just... Oh, yeah, I mean, as a Frenchman, I try, I think, I feel like the questions about sex are part of the questions about France, so that's why I swerved, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I swerved them a little bit. I didn't want you to be felt on the spot like the, like the France whisperer that you're always, <laughs> you're always called to be. Lovely, well, thank you so much uh, for joining me. Awesome.